So let's get started here. Uh, brief agenda. Uh, we're going to go. Uh, we're going to cover a link training protocol, which occurs over the aux channel in, in quite some depth. Uh, we are not going to cover HTCP 2.2 here, uh, because we're going to have a separate webinar on that topic in the near future, and you should get should get a notification on that. Uh, we are going to look uh, very closely also at the DisplayPort main link protocol elements, which includes the video transfer units, mainstream metadata, secondary data packets, such as the audio data and control elements and so forth. Uh, we'll have a brief question and answer session at the end of the webinar, and there should be a chat box available, available for you to submit questions. May not get to all your questions, but we'll do the best we can, and uh, feel free to contact me at any time. If you do ask a question, we'll get back to you regardless. Um, and there's going to be a brief survey at the end of the webinar, uh, just five questions. If you could be so kind to take part in that, that'd be very nice. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started here. This slide, uh, for lack of a better term, we could call DisplayPort Anatomy. Uh, notice that the uh, main link up at the top there has four lanes, four pairs, uh, and it is a unidirectional high bandwidth channel that's used to transport the video and the audio and associated metadata and uh, protocol control elements as well. Um, and because it transfers video and audio, it has to be a low latency channel as well. Uh, the aux channel down here in orange uh, is a bidirectional uh, half duplex channel with a data rate of one megabits per second. And it's used for link training and DPCD uh, register status reads and writes. I'll explain in a moment what the DPCD is. Uh, it also, over the aux channel, is the HTCP authentication protocol, as well as the EDID exchange. Uh, when we say bidirectional half duplex, what we mean is that uh, only one device, either the source or the sync, is transmitted at any given time. Uh, the main link, getting back to that, um, is a can be configured in either one, two, or four lane configurations. Uh, they all have to have the same link rate, and there are four link rates. There is uh, the reduced bit rate, 1.62 gigabits per second, high bit rate, 2.7, uh, 5.4 is a high bit rate, 2, and 8.1 is the high bit rate, 3, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about 8.1 gigabits per second link rate in this webinar, and that was introduced in 1.3, DisplayPort 1.3. Uh, unlike HDMI, there's no separate clock channel. The sync recovers the uh, data uh, using um, the, the transitions, link transitions. And we'll talk a little bit about that more in detail. Uh, the, there is also a interrupt or a uh, hot plug link here, and that does two things. It is a uh, hot plug is a connection detector detection mechanism. It's a way the source knows that a sync is connected to it, something's connected to it. And the, the hot plug also has an interrupt function in the event that there's a, a link failure or in any case where the sync uh, wants to inform the source that there's a problem and needs to read some registers. Uh, but probably the most important case is where you have a link failure, and we'll, we'll discuss that, uh, at, which point, at which point the sync will initiate a, a relink train. Okay, so uh, we're now going to go through the DisplayPort source sync connection sequence. And here is a little ladder di diagram here. You have the source over here, the sync over here, and here's the events down here. These arrows indicate the direction. So the uh, connection sequence uh, starts. Uh, with a hot plug, steady state voltage from the uh, sink to the source, and the source in response to that reads the EDID of the display, and the EDID has the video and audio capabilities of the of the display or whatever is connected to it. Uh, following that, uh, the source, the transmitter, reads the DPCD registers. And DPCD stands for DisplayPort Configuration Data. 
uh, and it's used to carry out link training. The DPCD describes the links, the sync's link capabilities and has a set of link status registers that the source reads to learn the status of the link. There are also a set of registers of write registers for the source to configure the link during link training. Uh, link training has two phases, clock recovery and channel equalization, which also involves or includes symbol lock and interlane alignment. If the content is protected, uh, flagged as protect, needing protection, then the HDCP authentication protocol is pressed into service to verify the sync. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the DisplayPort aux channel and how link training can be monitored. Uh, here is a case where we have a piece of test equipment. In this case, it's, uh, it's Telan LaCroix's Quantum Data 980 uh, test platform with a DisplayPort 1.4 module in it. And here we're emulating a source to test a display. So in this case, we're monitoring the aux channel of the, of the DisplayPort transmitter here. Alternatively, you can turn the uh, turn it around and you can uh, we can emulate a sync display port receiver and monitor the aux channel as at the receive port when testing a source and then we can also you can also monitor the aux channel passively by bridging on and looking at the aux channel transactions uh, between a source and a display okay so um, the uh, our, our utility, this aux channel analyzer, is a good utility for learning about the aux channel. And so I'm going to briefly go through the panels here so you can follow the, the discussion. Uh, the transaction log panel is just a, uh, a time uh, table of the transactions that have occurred on the aux channel. And they're assigned precise timestamps, as you can see here. The port number is indicated here. The type of transaction is shown over here, and the um, the notice that the types of transactions are color coded. For example, this pink is uh, an HDCP transaction. Uh, the blue are specifically link training transactions, and the green are are DPCD reads and writes that are not part of link training. Over here, you have the decoded. If you highlight any particular record, you get the decoded view of that transaction in human-readable text. Uh, the directional arrows here, right-facing arrow indicates the direction of transmission. No audio? Kidding me. Steve Craig. Um, and the left facing arrows uh, indicate a, a read message. You can see over here there's write, write and read indication, and link training type transaction here. Okay. DisplayPort connection sequence, we're now going to go through that in some detail. So here again, we have a ladder diagram. The source functions are over here, and the sync functions are over here. The transactions are in the middle. So you have a DisplayPort source, DisplayPort sync. And so the first thing that happens is this hot plug. And then the EDID is read by the, uh, uh, the source. And that here's an example of uh, an EDID decode here of the VESA block of the EDID. And uh, you can see that. So again, any, re any uh, transaction that we highlight is shown here. OK. An EDID, just a, for those of you who might not be familiar with an EDID, <clears throat> is a set of uh, data blocks in the display that informs the source what video and audio capabilities are supported by the display. Video capabilities are such things as resolutions, supported, frame rates, colorimetry, color space, 
sampling modes, uh, chroma subsampling, high dynamic range support, etc. Audio capabilities include audio formats such as compressed formats like Dolby DTS or uncompressed LPCM and uh, the sampling rates supported and bit depths and so forth. The EDID also includes some information about the display, the manufacturer, manufacturing time. Here's a couple of snippets of the EDID. This is not anywhere near all of the content. And here is uh, some additional information. This happens to be all in the VESA block, these two little screens. And then over here, we've got, uh, we've paged over to the CTA block. So there's a VESA block, block zero, and a CTA, or C, formerly known as the CEA block, block one. And it has uh, information about uh, uh, consumer electronic devices. So here you can see, for example, this particular display would support YCBCR444, YCBCR422, so there's some chroma subsampling supported here. RGB is always supported, so that's not indicated. Okay, so the next step uh, is that the source reads the DPCD capability registers over the aux channel of the, of the sync to determine the link capabilities of the connected sync. And in this case, you can see that this sync that we're connected to uh, operates at link rates up to 8.1 gigabits per second per lane. And also, it supports um, four lanes and it supports uh, downspreading. Actually, downspreading is a mandatory feature of a sync, but uh, downspreading or spread spectrum clocking is an optional feature of the source. And downspreading is a way to reduce electromagnetic interference, uh, and it works by varying the frequency, clock frequency, continuously throughout a range of frequencies. And this is called dithering. Dithering eliminates a constant clock frequency, which would result in high single peak frequency, which could create, would create higher uh, harmonics. High harmonics cause EMI. And the uh, extent to which EMI is reduced is uh, equal to the uh, amount that the clock is spread. Here's a little graphic of that. You can see that uh, if you have a single peak frequency here, these harmonics of this fundamental frequency are going to produce EMI throughout a wide spectrum, whereas if you uh, reduce the amplitude and spread it out over a, over a wider frequency range, they'll, they'll still have harmonics, but they'll be much lower. And so that, um, let's continue on here. Uh, the next step is uh, beginning the uh, actual clock recovery sequence here of the link training. And uh, so what's happening here is the transmitter, the source is sending an indication to the display what uh, bandwidth setting it's going to use, what link rate it's going to use. And in this case, we see it's going to use 8.1 gigabits per per second per lane. See that right indication right there? And also, it's going to write and indicate to the display that it's going to use four lanes. You see that there? And that's, that's this transaction here. It's a right transaction, the right facing arrow. Uh, and that it's, uh, the next thing it's going to do is in, indicate that it's not going to use Downspreading, see that there, downspread control. It's just writing to DPCD registers at this point. And the next step is that it's going to indicate uh, the source is going to begin sending a particular test pattern, test pattern, training pattern one. And that's being indicated to the source as well right here. See that? Uh, the next thing the source has to do is inform the sync what drive uh, settings are going to be used. And in this case, there are the voltage swing and the pre-emphasis setting is, uh, has to be defined. And we see that uh, it's zero. In other words, the, it's the lowest level of voltage swing, which is 400 millivolts. And there's not going to be any pre-emphasis uh, used 
And on any of the lanes, of course, uh, you get lane zero, lane one, lane two, lane three. All of them are the same. Now, the, there's a required amount of time that the source has to wait before reading to determine whether or not clock recovery has been successfully completed, and that is 100 millisecond, microseconds. And so that's what uh, this is here. And notice I've zeroed out this record at uh, zero time. Uh, I've redefined the time base as zero here. When, we, when it wrote the training pattern set one, and so you can easily tell how long it's been, how much time has elapsed before the, the source has read the status to determine whether or not uh, clock recovery has been completed successfully. And this next slide shows that uh, it has, in fact, been completed successfully on all lanes. So you see that read transaction and the acknowledgement here. Uh, the, next, the next phase of link training is channel equalization, which also includes symbol lock and interlane alignment. Uh, in this case, uh, it's going to use training pattern four, uh, four which is new uh, for 8.1 gigabit link rates. In fact, it's required when uh, link training is being conducted at 8.1 gigabits per second link rate. Uh, channel equalization is a function provided in the sync. Uh, equalization provides a high-pass filter function to compensate for a display port cable. Uh, and like all cables, exhibits the characteristics of a low-pass filter. So channel equalization uh, removes uh, the inner symbol interference that can occur, the results from the physical impairments of the channel. So here we see um, it's going to rewrite the, the voltage swing and the pre-emphasis settings. Now this slide is not technically correct because uh, the source will reuse or, or, or just use the uh, voltage swing and pre-emphasis settings that were used to achieve clock recovery. In this case, uh, it was zero, if you, know, if you remember from the previous slides. And... Uh, but we're showing a voltage swing of one and a preemphasis of one. So it's not technically correct, but uh, it's uh, just an example. Okay. So now uh, the, um, the source, again, must wait a specified amount of time before reading the DPCD registers to determine if channel equalization, uh, lane symbol lock, and interlane alignment have been completed successfully. If they have been completed, then link training is in fact completed. And in this example, we see that on all four lanes, 0, 1, 2, and 3, uh, uh, clock recovery, of course, channel equalization, symbol lock are completed, and the inner lane alignment is completed as well. You see that there. Okay, so uh, there are some irregular, irregular cases that come up, and this is a screenshot taken from an, ex an example where uh, testing a device uh, that could not achieve symbol lock, but uh, did achieve clock recovery and channel equalization here, and interlane alignment. Other cases, you might see one lane that is uh, does not successfully achieve symbol lock or, or channel equalization. And in that case, the, what the source is going to try to do is bump up the drive voltages or add preemphasis. And it, they, it may also try to reduce the link rate if possible and use more lanes if it was using, let's say, two lanes. Um, if you have a bad lane, it would be an option if you have one bad lane, as long as it's lane two or three, or actually three or four, <laughs> um, you could potentially, uh, a source might train trying to use two lanes at a higher link rate. I mentioned preemphasis. Preemphasis is a, is a way 
Um, I didn't go into any detail on that. Let me just uh, talk a little bit about that at the uh, right now. Preemphasis just uh, bumps up the front end of the rising or falling pulse uh, to give the sinks equalization circuit a better chance of recovering the uh, the data and um, overcoming the problem of inner symbol interference. Okay, so here you see a closer up view of this uh, symbol lock not being done successfully. Uh, and in that case, the uh, what happens is the sink will determine that an adjustment of the voltage swing and or preemphasis is required and indicate that to the source by setting a value in its adjust request DPCD register. You see down here, let me get closer up, the adjust request uh, indication here. The source is reading that uh, and then there's an acknowledgement here. And so the display or sync is telling the source, try the voltage swing of two, which would be 800 millivolts and a preemphasis level of one, 3.5 dB. And that would be used on all the channels. Presumably, after that was done, then uh, um, clock recovery and channel equalization would be completed. But here's an, here is the result. The uh, transmitter then does, in fact, use these values and recommences uh, link training. That's what's going on right here. Okay, so once link training is a, is a achieved, completed, uh, the link goes into link maintenance mode. And in, you know, if you have a short cable and you're not operating at the higher link rates, there's, uh, you typically would not have a problem during link training. Of course, with the higher link rates of 8.1 gigabits per second, one could, uh, it would be fair to anticipate that there would be higher incidences of link training failures. The longer the cable, the more failures. Uh, so once, um, I should point out that link training is not a guarantee that there won't be problems on the link. It's a best effort made to establish the drive voltages and the number of lanes and everything else, but it's not a guarantee. Uh, if there is a problem, there's an interrupt generated by the this hot plug mechanism, which is also uh, repurposed as a interrupt request. And that will cause, that will inform the source that um, there's a need to uh, retrain. For example, if there is a loss of clock lock or loss of symbol lock or loss of interlane alignment, the interrupt, uh, the IRQ interrupt will be generated using this hot plug lead. Okay, so here's an example of that link training. You can see I've highlighted this link training was done successfully, but then something happened in the link maintenance mode, and you see this hot plug pulse, and then this is all uh, going to be the um, reinitiation of link training. Let's see a close-up of that. Okay, I did mention at the outset we're not going to cover HDCP in any, any sort of depth. I'll just give you a sort of a hint of uh, an upcoming webinar we're going to hold on HTCP 2.2 authentication. Uh, you're going to have, uh, you know, we're going to go through all the transactions in the authentication of HTCP 2.2. The key exchanges, pairing, locality check, session key exchange, and so forth. And we'll also talk about um, HTCP 2.2 compliance testing as well. Okay, so now we're going to get into the DisplayPort uh, main link protocol where the audio and video streams uh, traverse. And so let's get into that. Now, uh, as a protocol analyzer, of course, you have to subsume or uh, include the functions of a sync, which are these items shown up top here in this depiction. You see the four lanes coming in, and the whole point of a receiver is to be able to extract the pixel data and audio data and, and the metadata from the incoming serialized stream. So here you see the deserialization, serial parallel on each 
lane independently. This is assuming four lanes, of course. Uh, and then you have um, the 8B, the decoding, the decoder, uh, which decodes the 8B, 10B data. And 8B, 10B encoding is used to achieve DC balance on the link and also aids in clock recovery. 8B, 10B encoding ensures that there's nearly equal numbers of logical zeros and logical ones on the link and therefore removing any pronounced DC components. Uh, the data is then um, descrambled. Uh, now, the, the K characters, the special uh, control character, characters called K characters, are not scrambled, but the source scrambles the data um, generally to make the pattern look like a pseudo random signal and thereby avoiding long sequences of bits of the same value or polarity. Uh, Scrambling facilitates clock recovery as well and reduces EMI. It reduces EMI by reducing the peak signal spectrum, uh, which reduces harmonics at specific frequencies. Uh, note that uh, during clock recovery, uh, scrambling is disabled except when using trading pattern 4 for 8.1 gigabits per second. Okay, so after data is descrambled, it's de-skewed to remove the two link symbol clock skew that's added to the stream by the source. Skewing reduces susceptibility to EMI pulses by making it less likely that a spurious pulse will disrupt important metadata symbols such as the MVID value, which is used to recover the pixel clock. Uh, if the lanes are skewed, then it would uh, pulse would affect only one of the lanes, for example. Uh, if the incoming stream is encrypted with HDCP, it's then decrypted. And then the mainstream uh, and secondary data uh, are demuxed and unpacked, separating and extracting the video data and audio data from the protocol and framing data. Finally, the pixel data is de-steered to assemble the pixel data that had been mapped across multiple lanes if multiple lane configurations were being used. Okay, so let's take a look uh, at some of these uh, uh, protocol symbols and data. And we're going to use a little capture utility we have here. Let me introduce you to that real quick so you can kind of follow what's going on. Going on. There's three panels. This top panel in circle of orange here is called the event plot panel. Time goes this way, left to right. And uh, you can zoom in and out, and you can see all the elements here, like this is a fill uh, data, this is video data, blanking start, blanking fill, the video blanking ID, secondary data start, MSA, mainstream attribute data. Uh, down here is this whole panel is the data to code panel, where it's just like the aux channel analyzer, where you have a table with precise timestamps assigned, time is going top to bottom. Each link number is indicated here, and each type of transaction is identified. If you highlight on any one transaction, you see a decoded text and the raw hex down here as well in the details portion of the data decode panel. Over here, we have the link symbol panel. Every link symbol is shown in a table. Again, top time goes top to bottom. In this case, we're seeing four lanes. One, two, three, four lanes of data. This is a bunch of fill data, zeros. And there's some meaningful data here. It's probably video. So let's get started on that. So this is a, uh, we're gonna look at an 8.1 capture. Uh, this diagram might help you understand how the video is arranged. There is a, kind of a holdover from CRTs. There's this vertical blanking period here horizontal blanking between each line. The vertical blanking occurs between frames. And of course you have the all important video here. So the videos here, that's this little symbol. I have everything color coded down here. You have metadata such as mainstream attribute, uh, info frames uh, occurring in the vertical blanking. You have audio samples uh, spread out in the vertical blanking. Sometimes you'll see it in the and the horizontal blanking as well. And these gray areas are just fill characters. 
DisplayPort has a lot of excess capacity, so the data, unused data is filled. And depending on the degree of the filling, depends on uh, the number of lanes used and the resolution, uh, the link rate, and so forth. Okay. So here uh, we are going to be using an 8.1 capture. So what I've done here is I've zoomed way in to look at one symbol clock right here. I've used a measuring device, blue. See this blue character here, or blue line, and the red line and the indicated up here. It's telling me that it's 1.235 nanoseconds. So if you take the inverse of that and multiply by 10, you do, in fact, get 8.1 gigabits per second per lane. In this case, there's four lanes being used. That's a lot of data. And we have, there's also a link rate change indicator here. This hex 1E, if you were to look at the spec, is, in fact, 8.1 uh, gigabits per second. Okay, so we've zoomed back here. Uh, way back, and I'm showing these little blue sections here are the, are, that, that's the vertical blanking, and everything in between here is all the pixel data and all the horizontal blanking and a whole lot of control symbols. We're going to zoom in to this area right here now. So we've zoomed in. Now we can see that uh, the delineation of each line. So this is a line of video, and here's the horizontal blanking, these little gaps right here. The videos here, you can see there's non-zero data, and then you see all those fill characters, zero down here on the link symbol panel. And you see that, um, you know, whatever we're highlighting on, we're highlighting on a particular video segment, in this case, which you really can't discern, uh, but it's saying there's 18 link symbols in that video data that we're highlighting. And look at, see that a little bit closer. Okay, so now we're going to zoom in a little bit further into this uh, vertical blanking segment right here. And let's do that. So we're actually right at the end of a frame. So this is the last horizontal uh, blanking segment in that frame, and then this is all the vertical blanking segment. You see a lot of interesting packets right here. We're going to get to that in a moment. Let's first zoom up, zoom down and look at the horizontal blanking. Uh, okay, the horizontal blanking, this is all blanking, zero, filled characters. And now we're going to zoom down and see what's happening just right at the end of a line. So we see that there's there's fill characters here, and then there's there's video, and this is like this would be the last pixel in the video uh, in the line, and then you have this four character sequence: blanking start, blanking fill, okay, that is always present uh, at the end of a line or a frame, and then you have this video blanking ID, a packet of information decoded here. So let's take a look at that real quick. So this is saying that, uh, no, it is not a video-only stream, okay? In other words, not just purely audio. Mute is not in place. Video blank, is it vertical blanking? No. Interlace, no, and so forth. It's just information uh, about the blanking that the, the source tells the sync. And at the end of that horizontal blanking, there's also a blanking end character. I don't think we're going to take a look at that, but you can see there's something there. Okay, so now we're going to zoom down and take a look at the end of the frame, the, uh, the commencement of the vertical blanking. So here now we've zoomed in. We see some interesting protocol characters here. So we're going to zoom in a little bit further right here, right here. This uh, video here is the last pixel in the frame. Okay, so now we've zoomed in a little more and we see fill characters, video, blanking start, blanking fill, blanking start again, this four character sequence, control sequence uh, to begin the blanking. And now you have a vertical blanking identifier packet as well there. In this case, you see the vertical, vertical blanking, yes. It's indicated as yes, this is vertical blanking. We'll talk about some of these other 
uh, values here, the MVID and the uh, MAUD in a moment. You also see a mainstream attribute packet here. We'll, uh, if we can go to that in the next slide. Yeah, mainstream attribute data here. Notice it begins and ends with the secondary data start, secondary data end packets right here, or little control elements. And I've highlighted that mainstream attribute packet. You can see uh, uh, the information that's provided there with it. A uh, bunch of timing information about the active and, and um, total video and uh, uh, horizontal and, and, and vertical lines and, and uh, so forth and pixels, uh, front porch, and also the uh, indication of the color depth, 10-bit deep color. The encoding is Y444, no color uh, chroma subsampling. And we're using YCBCR and the BT709 color space. Okay. So now we backed up a little bit to take a kind of a bird's eye look at this vertical blanking. Notice all these characters. These characters are just the repeated sequence of those four character sequence, a blanking start, blanking end, that have to occur uh, periodically. But notice there's some interesting looking spots in here where the, the cadence seems to be interrupted. And let's go take a look at that. Right, and we're going to zoom right in here, see what's going on there. And uh, we do, in fact, see that there's an audio sample there. So we've highlighted that. The audio sample is surrounded by control characters, secondary data start, secondary data end. And uh, I've highlighted that audio stream packet. And you can see that it's a two-channel layout, um, IEC 61.937. Get a little closer so you can read that. 6.144 uh, megabits per second bit rate. And so sample 0, sample 1, sample 2, sample 3 of channel 1 over here and channel 2 over here. And all the hex decodes down here. That's also shown, of course, in the link symbol panel. I, I didn't, I forgot to mention, all these panels are synchronized with one another. When you highlight any particular stream, whether in this uh, event plot or the data to code, they automatically sync up the three panels. Okay, so now we're going to look at, um, we're going to show a comparison between uh, two-channel LPCM at 32 kilo. Uh, uh, kilohertz sampling rate and 16-bit uh, depth, sampling depth. And we're going to compare that to 5.1 LPCM at 48 kilohertz sampling rate and 24-bit depth to show you the density of the audio packet. So here we're looking at the two-channel. Notice I've zoomed out at a particular level here, and the audio packets are somewhat sparse. And you can see that here, too. And notice there's only 921 audio samples here. I've done a a search here, a filter in this um, view here to, to only show the audio samples. Uh, so, and there's there's actually seven frames because uh, the timestamp, the audio timestamp packet occurs once a frame. We'll get to that in a moment. But 922 audio samples are shown in the seven frame capture. And this is two channel LPCM. But if we go to 5.1 channel LPCM, See, the cadence is interrupted more often in the vertical blanking. You see the density of the audio pulses or audio packets is much greater. And now we have 5,512 audio samples over the seven-frame period because we're at 5.1, 48 kilohertz sampling rate, and 21-bit uh, sampling size. So I mentioned this audio timestamp. The audio timestamp packet is again preceded by a secondary data start control element and a and then uh, bounded at the end by a secondary data end control packet and I've highlighted on that package you can see the information here it's this M AUD and NAUD elements and that is what allows the uh, the audio rendering device could be a display uh, to extract the sampling 
uh, the, the audio sampling rate out. You can see that's highlighted here, and you see these values here. Okay, also there is finally another audio packet is the audio CTA, uh, and that's an audio info frame if you're familiar with HDMI. And again, uh, preceded by a secondary data start and uh, ends with a secondary data end. And it has a variety of information, metadata about the audio being transmitted, two channel, LPCM, 16-bit sampling size, 48 uh, kilohertz. And uh, now, of course, you've heard high dynamic range. Um, that is becoming a very important feature. So DisplayPort has high dynamic range uh, info frames uh, supported as well. Again, secondary data start and end packets delineate or demark those uh, that info frame. And uh, here is the data that's in an HDR info frame. I'm not going to go into detail on that at the moment, uh, but suffice to say that this information enables a sync to render the video in the rich way that uh, HDR allows it to. Okay. Finally, uh, another package is a scrambling reset, scrambler reset packets, which are substituted for the blanking start characters in these four symbol sequences that occur uh, periodically. And the uh, scrambler reset is substituted every 512th such occurrence of the four character sequence. And the, in synchronous scrambling, uh, uh, there's a necessity to reset the scrambler every now and then to avoid, to avoid error propagation. There you can see that scrambler reset. Uh, we're now going to go over um, uh, pixel mapping, how the, how the pixels are mapped across the, the multiple lanes. And uh, this is, might be a little confusing for some of you, but again, this webinar is going to be recorded and you go back and look at it at your leisure. And of course, you can email me, email me with any questions. We're going to use SimptiBar in our sample here. We're going to compare an 8-bit and 10-bit uh, mapping. So the 8-bit mapping here, I've, <clears throat> we're going to zoom into the beginning, the first pixel of a frame. And we're going to be using 4K video in both cases, both the 8-bit and the 10-bit uh, color depth, uh, 8.1 gigabits per second link rate. Now, the first thing you notice at 8-bit, uh, uh, roughly, you know, the, the transfer unit, transfer unit's a combined uh, fill and um, video segment here. And the transfer unit, I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, the purpose of that is to, it's a mechanism to distribute the video in a line equally. Uh, and it enforces a consistent packet framework uh, with the same amount of pixel data and fill data for each <clears throat> transfer unit. And that avoids bursts of data, which can be difficult for syncs to handle. But notice with 8-bit data, 8-bit depth, uh, even 8.1 uh, gigabits per second link rate in 4K, you have almost as much fill characters as, as you have video. Of course, we're using four lanes. Uh, so here, what we're going to do is take a look at this first pixel here. So this comes right out of the spec here. We're going to look at only a lane one, or lane zero, and the first pixel, R0, G0, B0. All eight bits for eight-bit color depth are provided in one link symbol clock on one particular lane. So the mapping is very straightforward. You have a particular value of color, B4. Now I'm showing you the, the color values here. B4, B4, B4 for the green, red, green, and blue. Well, we know that's going to be a grayscale. Uh, you can see that right here, B4, all the way as far as the eye can see down here. Uh, because we're actually looking at that first pixel in SimptiBar, which is a grayscale panel. And so it's very easy to see that blue, or B here, 4 here, B, 4, B, 4, all the values here for the first pixel. And that's shown down here because we've highlighted that. We've got a marker set, and you can see B, 4, B, 4, B, 4.
Okay, this is 8-bit uh, uh, pixel mapping. Let's look at 10-bit. Uh, and again, we're using the same. Uh, it's 4K, it's 60 hertz, 8.1 gigabits per second, four lanes. First thing you notice is that uh, now there's more video because 10-bit uh, deep color has more video than 8-bit. So now the relative proportion in any given transfer unit is predominantly video, clearly. You can see that. So now let's look again at that first pixel of SMPTE bar in a frame. And this uh, is taken from the spec, and you can see it's uh, not quite as intuitive. We're going to look only at lane 0, and we're only going to look at um, the first pixel. Notice that the R value, the pixel value for R, is shared across two symbols right here, 0 through 10 or 0 through 9, the 10 bits. Same with green. 0 through 3, 4 through 9 is in this 4 through 9 is in link symbol 2, but link symbol 3 has the, the rest of the green value, and then blue, same thing. It's shared across two symbols, link symbols on lane, on lane 0. Okay? So what does that look like? Uh, we now notice the values here are not uniform, even though it's a grayscale. Uh, 2D on all four lanes, 0B, 4, 2, 4, 2, across the board. And so here we have, again, we're highlighting this pixel right here. And now I've exploded this little segment out so you can see it. These are the four lanes again, the value of B4, B4, B4. So B4 here. And uh, notice that the, but the pixel value is no longer the same as the symbol value here because the red for 10-bit color has to roll over onto the second link symbol. So you got 2D0, 2D0. Same thing here, 2D0 for the green. And the blue, same thing. As I say, this might be a little confusing if you haven't seen it before, you haven't looked through the spec, but uh, if you're really interested, you can study this slide uh, once we repost the webinar and uh, or shoot me an email, and maybe I can uh, clarify it a little more for you. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I, I really wanted to cover in this webinar, but uh, I, I think it warrants a separate webinar. In fact, we are going to do a separate webinar on multi-stream transport. It's uh, pretty involved. I'll give you a little hint of that. We're going to show the transactions used over the AUX channel to set up the MST, uh, multi-stream transport uh, messages, to set up the, uh, the topology. And we're also going to show you how you can do the captures independently of all the virtual channels in a multi-stream transport. Uh, finally, so we have been talking about DisplayPort uh, protocol analysis with the our uh, 980B test platform. I should mention, uh, Teledyne LaCroix also manufactures oscilloscopes that um, they have uh, this QPHY DisplayPort software for the WaveMaster ZDA, DDA, 8ZI series oscilloscope provides an automated test environment for running the VESA DisplayPort 5 compliance test specification. And it also supports HBR3 uh, data rates at 8.1 gigabits per second. So please contact your LaCroix rep if you're interested in that solution. I want to first thank you for all attending. Uh, I think we have some time for some questions. Um, I know a lot of people don't like to ask questions in a webinar, so feel free. You see my email right here. Feel free to contact me if you have outside questions. And as I mentioned at the outset, we're probably going to have quite a few uh, chat questions to address, more than we can address. In fact, I'm not sure how many we can. But I will make it a point to go through all the questions and get back to you with answers as best I can. Might take a week or two. Uh, also, I want to uh, 
mention that we're going to support uh, provide some additional webinars coming up. HDCP 2.2 testing, I mentioned that during the web, this webinar. Also, I mentioned uh, we'll be doing an MST webinar. Uh, we will also be doing a DisplayPort 1.4 protocols webinar where we'll cover such things as DSC and FEC, uh, dis display stream uh, compression and forward error correction. And we may do something related to uh, dynamic high dynamic range. Dynamic high dynamic range is where the, there's a new info frame for uh, high dynamic range each frame as opposed to once per, uh, once per stream. Uh, again, I want to thank you for attending uh, the webinar, and I hope you learned a lot from it. And uh, there is going to be a brief survey that's going to pop up at the end. So let me see if there's any questions that have come in. Uh, there's one question here. Uh, I did mention this. Uh, if HDCP 2.2 is going to, uh, compliance testing is going to be supported. In fact, it is. Um, in fact, it is, it is now. We support uh, uh, HDCP 2.2 compliance testing. And as far as I know, that's not uh, particular to any link rate. Uh, so it would be supported HBR3 uh, link rates. And that's also, by the way, source sync repeater and also on, on HDMI. Um, what else do we have here? Do you actually support mainstream transport? Uh, I did mention we're going to do a webinar, or excuse me, multi-stream transport. Uh, I did mention in the webinar that we're going to do a webinar on multi-stream transport. In fact, we do support that. Uh, both on the source and the sync side. We can emulate a source that supports setting up of the topology and an MST branch device with up to three downstream nodes. So, uh, okay, so we are going to, uh, folks, we're going to wrap this up again. Thank you very much. Please uh, be so kind to take the survey at the end there and uh, again, greatly appreciate your attendance. Thank you very much.